Okay, guys, what's going on? SmartHelping.com back here. It's Thursday. I did a... I showed you the start of this model on Thursday. It's for a driving range. I've now completed it. A full 10-year financial model. So, uh, I'm really... I really like the logic for the revenue assumptions. I feel like that's going to possibly have other uses, but you know, right now it's, it's mainly this template for a driving range. Um, who knows what else it might be used for? You'll see once you see the logic. Also, I did a a fairly in-depth tax. Well, you'll see on the taxes, but I did do taxes. I did not do depreciation logic, um, but there is capex and, and it's basically EBITDA and cash flow that's what you'll be able to see at the the bottom line um so what i'll do now is go through every tab all the assumptions and at the end you'll know exactly how this works and exactly how to use it um so first is the control tab and through the whole model you'll notice that all cells in light yellow with blue text will be editable no other cells should be changed also these assumptions are arbitrary so you should know that like the debt proceeds investor proceeds this exit cap rate all the assumptions across the whole model are just i just put in numbers to make sure the math works but when you actually go in to build your own model you have to research all your assumptions and see if it makes whatever makes sense for your situation okay so first tab control tab start off with the start year this defines the timing of the whole model for and it goes out for up to 10 years you can define an exit month in any month of the full model i just put na here which means there is no exit but let's say you put in december 2030 um that's just going to define when all operations stop there is a cap rate which is what i it's more that's more of a real estate term but um I thought that was the best way to define an exit value for this. And all the cap rate means is you're going to take net operating income uh, divided by this cap rate to get uh, exit valuation. And I'm not really going to go in and explain everything about what a cap rate is in this model uh, or in this video, but um, you can look it up. Uh, but that's how we're going to define the exit valuation for the whole um project if you decide to exit if not you can just hit na and that's fine too the exit valuation is just going to be and it's using a trailing 12 month ebitda or a, a net operating income so if you decide to exit like an odd month like september it's going to take the past 12 months from that month um against the cap rate okay Next, we have cash sources. So if you start a business, um, you need money. This is how much you're going to borrow from a bank, if any. If, if this is not applicable, you can just put zero here. All that's going to do is raise the amount of uh, equity that you need from either the owners, or which would be yourself, or whoever's uh, running this thing, or investors. And so this shows you um, if you put in an amount for investors, a share they get, you got an implied valuation, and then any amount remaining after that. So this is saying you need 432000 um to fund the, the project. Um, 250000 is from investors. The rest is from owners. Now, you could put all of it from investors. Let's say you put, you know, 432719 and that's fine. You, you, you could define how much those investors are going to get. Um, if there are no investors, that's fine too. You can put zero here, the zero there. Um, the div error here is no problem. And you'll just see like on the distribution, it'll just be for the project level, which is going to be the exact same as the owner cash flow. Um, let's move on. Oh, let me undo this. Put some values back into here. And then you get your breakdown of debt and equity, depending on what you put in up here. Uh, so the next is revenue assumptions. And I talked a lot about how I came up with this and built it in the like how to instructional video. That's like an hour and I don't know, however long. But essentially, you define the month that operations start, 
within your 10 year period, probably going to be sometime in the first year. And then you define assumptions for um, the driving range. The biggest one is the number of slots you have. Um, so that's going to define a lot of your startup costs, depending on how many mats you need and dividers and tees and, every, and balls and everything else. Um, and the way I wanted to do this was a capacity model. So essentially you, you put in the average time a golfer will, will be at a slot, the average hours that the um, your driving range is open per day and the days open per month. And then based on that, we can back into, you know, your total hours open per month, the amount of minutes that backs into the maximum amount of, of uh, basically slot minutes available. And then based on the cost per bucket, you get a revenue here. This is your max revenue and max golfers per day, 400. Now, what I've done is included seasonality because this is the biggest thing with the golfing or driving range is you probably can't be open, you know, every day of the entire year. It might be seasonal. Now it also it it could be seasonal and you could still be open all year round depending on what where you are building this thing. So to account for all those variables, um, I had a seasonality matrix here. So what this does is you can define in each of the twelve months of the year what percentage of the maximum capacity you think you can achieve. And maximum capacity just means you're literally using every minute of the time you're open and people are literally lined up at the door and every time, you know, you just, there's no break. Now that's not unlo that's not likely, but what you can do is use that as a, as a maximum and then say some percentage of that you're going to attain. And then based on that percentage you attain, it will result in some amount of golfers uh, per day here at the bottom. And so this up here lets you define in each month. So this is, you know, January, February, March, April, May. And actually, I probably should put the month here. Equals. Uh, actually, this can be hard coded. Jan, Feb, March. July, just so you can really see what this is and it's not confusing so months are going across the top and years are going uh, down to the bottom line and what that's saying is well in year one you might get a certain capacity of golfers and then you might grow over time and then you might um, you know at some point you might stop growing and, and reach uh, stabilization so here you can define that uh, for each year and f for each month of the year where, where your most business is coming from. And then this is going to drive actually the amount of golfers per month um, for, over time. Now this is a little helper calculation down here where you can look at each year and sit and, and this is going to show you the max based on your total slot uh, driving range slots that you've you've input on the revenue assumptions here in row seven. This is going to show you the max golfers that could ever exist in a given day. And then based on your percentage, it shows you the, the expected golfers per day at a given percentage. And so you can use this to estimate what you think these numbers should start at and how far much they should grow to at a given year. Um, so these calculations don't go anywhere. This is just to help you. These calculations do go somewhere. This is going to drive, well, the entire model. So that's revenue. Let's move on to startup costs. So what I've done here is I figured out the main startup costs for driving range, which is, you know, mats, balls, buckets, T drivers, rubber tees, ball trays. These are the main variable costs at startup. So that means it's based on how many driving slots you have. There's unit cost. Um, also, there's an amount per slot you might have. So if there's um, two per slot here for driving range buckets, you're basically going to take um, $7 times two times the number of slots. So that's what the calculation is going on here for all these um, based on the amount per slot the unit cost, and then the number of slots you started with here in year one. Now, if you add more in the future, this is automatically going to calculate for you. If we look at the monthly PL, you can see 
right here, added slots per month. So let's go over. So we know the first one is always going to be in year zero because that's just a start. But the next one, let's see, where do we put it? There. In January 2023 is five, and that's going to trigger another CapEx spent here. And you can see all the different variable start of co or variable costs for that. Um, so that's all automated. There's then initial startup costs that are not automated. These are, are not going to go forward in time, which would be like your initial banners for the driving, for the yardage, ball dispenser, ball washer, uh, a, a cage, range ball racker. And then I put land and construction here. And if you are, instead of renting, let's say you're actually building on land, buying land and building your range on it, that, that would go here. Um, and these are your total initial startup costs, along with this, these. And then over time, let's say you're, you're doing expansions to add more slots. Well, then you can account for that cash outflow in future CapEx here. So you pick the month and the amount, and that will then flow through to the model as a, a cash um, outlay. All right, so those are startup costs. Let's go to operating. So this is just your monthly cost, and there's two different types because with C with uh, seasonality, you are only going to have some costs when you're open and some costs you might have year-round. So I identified these middle slots as your year-round costs. So whatever it is, it happens every month of the year. And then these top uh, five here and then bottom ten are only are costs that only populate during active um, months of the year and this this will automatically know if it's an active month based on this these percentages and it will check if this is zero percent for that month of the year then it will be zero and that cost will not show up so a lot of this stuff is really specific to a seasonal business um, and I haven't done much of this logic before with, I've done some seasonality, but this is probably the most, most in-depth uh, seasonality uh, piece of logic I've done. Then you've got, uh, maybe you, if you have credit cards or accept credit cards, a certain number of transactions go through that and there's going to be a fee there. Um, and so that's, that's how your monthly ongoing costs are calculated over 10 years and these are this is the monthly cost in each of the years not the annual so it's saying 1200 a month in year one 1320 months in year two and so on um, and you can pick the start month of these as well um, if it's relevant so some costs might not start um, until you expand so this would allow you to account for that nice and easy and that's all your assumptions. So once you go through and fill all that out, you're going to get a monthly and annual P&L summary. You can see uh, this shows the whole 10 years. is showing you all of the revenue logic and how we're driving down to revenue. Um, and it's based on basically buckets purchased per month, which is all based on this logic here. The maximum and then the percentage of that maximum reached is then going to define how many buckets are actually purchased. Uh, so here in March, if you just want to look at it, we've got 500. And that's basically saying you've got 20 slots. You're going to use a max capacity of five. The maximum daily slot at maximum capacity at um, 20 slots would be 400. Um, And that is 400 golfers per day. So here we're saying um, the actual purchase amount is 20 because that's 5% of 400. And then we're multiplying that by our revenue row 10, which is the amount of days open in a given month because we got to convert the daily amount to month to uh the monthly total because we're doing a monthly summary here so 20 per day times that by the amount of months you get 500 per month and then you just multiply that by the cost of or the price of a bucket to get the revenue and so that is how revenue is calculated you can see we just did more in the summer so like in june we could have a max of 400 uh per day 
If we reach 30% of that, it's 120 per day. You multiply 120 by the open months, you get 3,000. You times that by the bucket cost or the price per bucket. Now, the other calculation as kind of a sanity check is row 13, and this shows you the amount of sl of times each driving slot is used per day. So you've got 20 slots, and on average, each slot is used six times per day. That's another way to just check if your assumptions make sense. If this number doesn't seem right, if it's like 150, um, it's probably not likely that one slot is used 150 times in one day, so you've probably put in assumptions that are too high and don't make sense. Um, so this is a good reasonable, like... I guess the best way is it, to call it is like a sanity check on your assumptions um, to help you. Uh, operating costs work just like I explained, all di dynamic based on what you put in the assumptions. Your net operating income is then based on the revenue less those operating expenses. Then we've got debt service if applicable, debt balance, debt proceeds, debt repayment. So if there is an exit and there's an exit value, it assumes the debt, whatever it is, would be paid back at that month as well. We have our startup costs, and these are the variable ongoing based on the number of driving range slots added. You've got your one-time startup costs here. Uh, then we have total startup costs, which is adding both of these sections together. Um, proceeds from the exit. Then you've got cash flow pre-tax, um, taxes. So for taxes, I did a, I did it so you can just manually enter what you think the taxes are each year. There's just so many variables here that I don't like to do auto calculations for it. Um, however, so these are these would be taxes on regular operations. I did do some automation on the taxes on the sale. So I put um, right here in, in cell C8, the tax rate on sales proceeds. So I just put 20% out. It could be, it varies by region. But that will then flow into whenever there is an exit. Let's put one in here just to see it. Um, so at 20% of, let's say 3.4 million, 600,000 goes out in taxes. Net proceeds is this. And that all flows down to, um, well, pre-tax cash flow, taxes, and then and then uh, post-tax cash flow is going to take your operational taxes less that those taxes on the sale um, plus whatever the pre-tax cash flow was. Uh, so that was a little bit of a different way to do taxes, but I think it's necessary. Um, and I just felt like doing it. Um, sometimes uh, a lot of m people who do models don't even bother with taxes um, because it's just, it's so variable. But I figured doing a manual input for it is fine. Um, at least you can, you, there's a placeholder there. Um, and then finally, you've got, based on the equity, you've got a net cash position over time. And you've got, uh, future and it, this is future expansion I just put it down here but it's flowing up to this number you can see it's added here and that should be whoops that should be taking this year save that make sure the monthly is doing the right timing yeah that is Double check one of these. Yep. Okay. And then I did some sanity checks at the end too. So the ending cash position here should always match the monthly ending cash position because it's the same numbers. So this is 4.378 million. Here you get 4.378 million. Executive summary 4.378 million. So we have the right numbers uh, populating. Um, also, this should equal your annual cash flow after equity. This should equal, did I do a calculation here? Well, it'd be this 
plus this. So true. True, true, true. Okay, so that's good. That's just a good checker. Um, save that. So after you've got monthly and annual detail, that all rolls into the executive summary, which is just showing high-level financial items like your revenue, OPEX, EBITDA, your other cash items, and then the resulting cash flow down here. Showing some charts for revenue and EBITDA. Also showing project level internal rate of return, equity multiple, uh, project cash return. Um, equity, oh, sorry, that was equity required, equity multiple here. Um, now, based on these numbers and what we've plugged in here, the investors are actually not, they have a negative uh, multiple or something less than one, which means they actually didn't get paid back the money they invested. And let's see if we, oh, hold on. We got to extend this out for 10 years. So I did, normally I do five years. So let's, let's do that real quick. So that's going to L. I just don't feel like restarting this video, which is, so I'm just going to do it right here. So that goes to L. So right, it's 11. I was going to say, I know there was more cash to the investors than, than they put in based on the assumptions I have in here. So this needs to go to L. Okay. That makes more sense. And L. 2.6 plus 3, 6, 4, 3. Yep. Okay, that looks good. Yep, so the project level internal rate of return should always be somewhere in the middle of the investor and owner. It'll always be in between these two. That's another good way to check if you've done the calculation right. Um, so this is this kind of cash flow analysis, which is going to show the amount of cash available to distribute each month based on the positive and negative monthly cash flows, the amount of equity remaining that's been already put in. Um, because this is going to count, the cash needed is going to count any burn or negative operating months um, to the overall cash position, which is, I think is the most accurate and best way to do this. Um, so project level, we already went over that. You can do a discount rate and get a net present value for that. Um, you can also do that for the investor portion and the owner portion with different discount rates and get a net present value. Um, you also got internal rate of return of each um, and a little chart to show the cash flows for investor versus owner. Then we have visuals, the last tab. And I like, let's put the exit at NA just to see these a little bit nicer. So key financial results per year, revenue, costs, EBITDA, Annual cash flow post tax, monthly cash flow post tax. You can see these dips are when you've got expansion costs going. Uh, cumulative cash flow, uh, percentage of max capacity achieved. I thought that was a decent percentage to show on a, a monthly and annual basis. Um, basically saying if you had people lining out the door, this would be 100% like for the whole time you're open. And 20% saying, well, you're 20% of that. Um, I don't think anyone ever would have this at 100%, but um, your seasonality and percentage assumptions will define this. I also put in average times driving slot use per day. This is a sanity check. I thought that was a good visual to have uh, monthly and yearly. And then I also put average EBITDA per slot per year, which is based on executive summary. I just took the total slots at the end of the year. Um, well, the EBITDA divided by the total slots at the end of the year to get that um, those numbers all right well that is gonna do it for this model I'm gonna post it to smarthelping.com I'm gonna post it to eloquence I'm gonna post it to eFinancial models um, it'll be a one-time fee of $45 to purchase it and I encourage you to check out smarthelping.com 
I've got over 100 templates I've done in the past six years. Um, all kinds of industries, all kinds of uh, use cases as well. Not just business like business models like this or, or uh, financial models, but also inventory tracking, ARAP stuff. Um, a lot of good financial calculators for different things. Uh, cost of goods, uh, FIFO, cost of goods sold stuff. Um, just all kinds of things. So feel free to check it out and I'll see you guys on the next one.